So welcome to the Open Group webinar on secure global IT and supply chains. The Open Group, in particular the Open Group Trusted Technology Forum, has been addressing the problem of product integrity and supply chain security for commercial off-the-shelf information and communication technology, which we refer to as COPS ICT, for the past three to four years. We published the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard specifically focused on mitigating the risk of maliciously tainted and counterfeit products in 2013. And last week at the Open Group Conference in San Francisco, we announced the launch of the OTTPS accreditation program, which accredits organizations who conform to the best practice requirements in the standard. So this webinar is going to provide insight into our work that got us to this point, the result in the accreditation program that now is available to all, and the outreach efforts for increasing awareness of these efforts. So later we'll hear from some of our members who had a significant impact on the creation of the standard and the accreditation program as they each present a portion of the presentation, and at the end we will participate in question and answers for that section. So I'll provide a brief overview of the global challenge we're facing, how the Open Group is positioned to address it, and some insight into how we got started and where we are today. So the problem. COPS ICT products are developed globally and used globally. They're built from hardware and software components developed and manufactured around the world, and they're integrated into critical infrastructure, government systems, and commercial solutions. And at every point in that pro the product's life cycle, they're vulnerable to the threats listed here. Today, the world relies on global supply chains, and therefore, constituents from around the world must work together to protect them. And the global nature of this problem is one of the main reasons the Open Group was chosen as the place to work through and address this very, very significant problem. So a little bit about the Open Group. It is a global organization with over 40,000 participants from over 95 continents with over 400 members, headquarters in over 37 countries. The Open Group provides a vendor-neutral environment where customers, both governments and commercial customers, and technology providers can come together to create standards and accreditation programs that are consensus-based and meet the needs of all the participants. So how did the Open Group's Trusted Technology Forum get started and become part of the Open Group? It began with a series of roundtable discussions with the Open Group and DOD, ATNL, and CIO, and it included many of the most mature IT providers in the industry. During those meetings, the following questions were posed and discussed. Now that governments and commercial entities around the world are moving away from high assurance customized solutions to COPS ICT, how can commercial customers and government confidently identify good, trustworthy COPS ICT products and their providers? So the recommendation that came out of these early meetings were these. If all the major IT providers are building quality products and for the most part secure products, then doesn't it make sense for them to get together, pool their practices, and come up with a set of best breed, best practices that could be established as a standard for the rest of industry? And doesn't it make sense to then build a brand around the standard to identify those trusted technology providers who are conforming to the standard. So that's how it all got started. These informal series of meetings found a lot of traction and the constituents decided to form under the Open Group as the Open Group Trusted Technology Forum and began some serious work on uh, responding to those recommendations. So who are those constituents? Here they are. As you can see, there's from the member chart, there's a broad representat representation of COTS ICT providers, integrators, and third-party information assurance laboratories. There's product distributors, and there's government-related constituents. In my humble opinion, three of the most important takeaways from this slide are these. When we say we, 
defined and published the standard and accreditation program, we mean the membership. This is the we that we're talking about, and it was all done by consensus, which is a huge feat. Secondly, we meet and have met over the past three or four years at least twice a week, meeting not only with the technical participants from some of these companies, but with the chief security officers and the chief technology officers, the VPs and program directors of the companies. That indicates an amazing amount of talent and commitment. And finally, it's a true example of industry working together with government to create something that's reasonable, open, and practical. And by practical, I mean that it's actually based on input from members who understand how product development and supply chain operations really work in the field and therefore can identify the best practices that are needed to mitigate the risks of paint and counterfeit products. So one last slide from me, just a brief overview of our milestones. As mentioned, we started with early collaboration, start, formed the OTTF in 2011, began working on a standard immediately, published a snapshot and version 1.0 of the standard in two, 2013. While we were finalizing the standard, we were also developing conformance criteria, the accreditation policy, and the assessment procedures that would be used in the pilot program, all of which we started at the end of 2012. The accreditation program was finalized and approved in October 2014. We implemented the program and launched officially last week, also announcing that one of our pilot participants had successfully made it through the accreditation program. And we're pleased to announce that again. That successful candidate was IBM, who was accredited as an open trusted technology provider for their application, infrastructure, and middleware, AIM, software business division. So congratulations again to IBM. So with that, I will turn it over to Edna Conway, the Chief Security Officer, Global Supply Chain for Cisco Systems, and Vice Chair of the OTTF, who will talk about the challenges of global supply chain and how the standards address them. So Sally laid the foundation for what we're really all about. And after the initial conversations that we had, what we came to the conclusion as a public-private partnership that was that we did need to identify this key challenge. Let me remind you of what that is. Sally, why don't you build this out? The challenge really is that we who make commercial off-the-shelf information and communication technology leverage a supply chain that reaches around the world. As we look to those from whom we would source, those who partner with us in the fabrication and the methodologies by which we deliver in between the supply chain and ultimately to the end customers of the supply chain, we wanted to have a program that would enable the acquirers to look at the product, yes, but rather on top of that, to look at the organization and to say, we understand that from these organizations, we can buy products that are trusted. We're buying with confidence and the products are trusted because of something somewhat unique. We actually, in this accreditation program and standard, encompass the full product life cycle across commercial information and communication technology. And what we're doing is saying we want to look at this end-to-end -end life cycle because we are aware of the fact that risks can occur at any part of this supply chain or product life cycle. So Sally, why don't you go to the next slide? So the takeaway there is public-private partnership looking comprehensively around the globe at the supply chain itself and as well looking comprehensively at the end-to-end -end product life cycle. In order to focus ourselves, oops, sorry, go back there just for one moment, if you would, Sally. In order to focus ourselves in this first version of the standard, we tackled two not insignificant, quite substantial threats, but these two. And these two have been on the minds of our customers and the community of acquirers of information and communications technology. And we'll talk a little bit about the risks associated with them. They include maliciously tainted products or counterfeit products. So Sally, if you'd go to the next slide, that would be great. So you're all familiar with what the risks are. I won't drill into them, 
but I want you to take your mindset to why this standard is somewhat unique. By addressing these two particular threats across this spectrum that you can see below on this slide, what we've done is tried to take a comprehensive approach, thinking through the nascent stage of when information and communication technology is begun as an idea, how it's developed and designed, and taken through each step a set of practices, whether they're technology practices, whether they're physical security practices or logical processes, that together establish the right steps in the right stage of this product life cycle and supply chain to give that higher degree of trusted products and allow our acquirers to buy with confidence. Sally, if you can go to the next slide. So let me give you a little bit of insight, this is a very high level, into the best practice areas that we address. And we've broken this down into two major categories across this comprehensive product life cycle or supply chain, specifically product development and engineering requirements, secure development and engineering requirements, and the third one is supply chain. So you can see some of the critical focus areas that the requirements drill down on. And I'm just going to highlight a few that I think are unique. We really talked a lot in product development and engineering requirements about not just the traditional development and design practices, but product sustainment. Recognizing that given the ubiquitous reliance on information and communications technology that those who have it within their networks and how they use it, rely upon, we must inevitably ensure the integrity of the product portfolio and the organization supporting it throughout its life. For secure development and engineering requirements, what we've done is embrace all of the traditional best practices, but also reminded ourselves that we have to have an outward facing view as well. So I want to highlight that what we are also embedding within the standard is a mandate to regularly monitor and assess the impact of the never-ending changes that we see in the threat landscape for information and communications technology. So you can see we've addressed full product life cycle, sustainment through utilization, and awareness of the external environment that affects our information and communication technology community. Sally, if you could go to the next slide. From the perspective of supply chain, we really, again, took a unique, comprehensive approach, thinking with some of the best partners that we had here as members of the standard body itself, and thinking about what we wanted to drill down into. And clearly, um, you can see what they are, but I wanted to highlight just a few. So risk management and security go hand in hand. Understanding the risk landscape and implementing security in a comprehensive fashion must be aligned and are in fact embedded throughout the supply chain requirements in the Open Trusted Technology Partner Standard. Additionally, again focusing on the end-to-end -end product life cycle, we have embraced raw materials, work in process, finished goods, and products that are at their end of life. And those products include hardware and software. They are somewhat unique, but as you know, in information and communications technology, work hand in hand. So that's a quick overview of the in-depth requirements embodied within this version of the TTPS. Thank you. So now I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the standard body, Andras Sakal. Thank you very much, Edna. That was an awesome overview. Uh, so I am the chair, and uh, my name is Andras Sakal, and my segment is intended to help viewers understand the purpose, process, and value of the recently announced OTTPS accreditation program. And while the typical uh, cyber threat is very well understood by most folks, um, you know, maybe you're not as familiar with that of technology supply chain threats. So we've tried to kind of boil this down into a table as a reference to help you understand uh, the landscape and which threats the OTTPS standard 
and accreditation program is intended to mitigate. Now, of course, for more information, you can download the freely available OTTPS standard or shameless plug. You can get a copy of the most recent issue of the uh, IBM Journal of Research, which I published an article on this particular subject, uh, and, and endeavor to learn a little more. But version 1.0 of the OTTPS standard and the accreditation program are focused on helping to mitigate what we believe are the two most significant threats, as Edna pointed out, counterfeit components and maliciously tainted products or components. From a taint point of view, uh, we also think our standard goes a long way to mitigating uh, those other risks that are outlined here. However, we do not explicitly focus on the insider or negligent cases. Next chart. We believe that the OTTPS standard and now the accreditation program is exemplary of a holistic approach to securing the global supply chain. The, the Trusted Technology Forum was founded by our customers and includes representatives from you know, each of the, the major stakeholders who participated in the development of the standard and the accreditation program. This ecosystem is essential to effectively addressing the risk uh, uh, in establishing a normative standard and representative trustworthy accreditation program. Remember the OTTPS accreditation is an organizational assessment against the industry best practices described in the OTTPS, the standard. And this industry ecosystem is depicted here and includes providers, in other words the, the technology producers, their suppliers, component suppliers, integrators, and, and in partnership uh, with standard organizations like the Open Group and the labs that are responsible for third-party accreditation to the standard. Next chart. Last week, the TTF officially announced the launch of the OTTPS accreditation program and, of course, IBM's uh, successful pilot and accreditation for our AIM product service division. Um, uh, I'm sorry, AIM product division. I, I used to be part of the AIM Services Division, so I got that on my brain. While the development of the uh, standard requires uh, open group membership, uh, both the standard and the accreditation program are open and freely available to the public. The standard can be downloaded and used by the organizations, any organization, free of charge. And the accreditation program, while operated by the open group, um, uh, is available to the public as well and uh, accreditations are conducted by third-party labs on behalf of the open group following the accreditation processes, practices, and policies that were established um, within the TTF and by the industry. So uh, an open OTTS accreditation, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, an, an OTTPS accreditation lasts for three years before an organization must re-accredit. Uh, in the meantime, an accredited organization warrants and represents that they continue to maintain the practices that meet the accreditation conformance criteria. And they can associate the OTTPS accreditation logo with the products produced by the accredited organization. And we believe this approach will significantly increase the trust across vendors, suppliers, and acquirers to build with integrity and buy with confidence. So an organization seeking accreditation uh, may only produce one product or many products. It doesn't matter. The accreditation process works for providers of all sizes. In most cases, providers will uh, accredit an organization that's responsible for producing many products. Um, in which case we have developed an approach that uses established techniques for identifying a sample size that will be used to assess the candidate organization and, you know, make the accreditation practicable and affordable. This is called the, sc the scope of accreditation and may consist of a product line, business unit, or, you know, maybe an entire software company. It really depends on the provider and how they want to approach the accreditation. So as I said previously, the accreditation lasts for three years in which the organization warrants that their practices represent 
those defined in the OTTPS standard, the best practices. Um, should any non-conformances be identified, the organization must remediate, um, com i.e., come back into compliance in a timely manner, or they'll be removed um, by the accreditation authority, in this case the open group, uh, from the accreditation re registry. The OTTPS trademark represents to the industry a trusted technology provider. So why the open group? Why did the customer and the industry select the Open Group? The reason is really very simple. It's a very significant history of effective private, uh, public-private partnership, standards development, and a track record of successful certification conformance programs, uh, which includes really well-known profession certifications, uh, the Unix uh, specification standard conformance to it and POSIX, and even lottery and WAP conformance uh, to best practices, as well as core technology standards. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Fiona Pattinson uh, of ATSEC to talk about uh, how we are managing third-party labs and assessors to implement accreditation. OK. Thank you very much, Andras. Um, I'm Fiona Pattinson, and I'm working uh, with one of the uh, already recognized assessor companies uh, that uh, were part of the, of the launch uh, last week. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how the assessment and the uh, becoming a recognized assessor works in this program. First of all, uh, some of the, the key points about uh, the assessment is that the Open Group and the OTTF Forum have produced some publicly available assessment procedures. This uh, will help achieve objectivity, repeatability, and consistency as we're performing the different assessments. Um, when we look at the standard and, and the assessment procedures, we find there are two types of requirements that need to be assessed. We look for evidence that the processes that are recommended and um, part of the standard are there in place and that they are documented by the organization. But we are not just performing a process assessment. We have a second uh, set of uh, checks that we make to the implementation evidence. So we look to see that those processes are indeed implemented in the organization. The Open Group program has established formal rec recognition of the OTTPS third party assessors, and they have established criteria and examination, which I'm going to explain in a little bit more depth in the next few slides. Um, they receive certificates, and there is a public registry of the recognized assessor companies so that uh, this can be checked. The uh, requirements to become a recognized assessor, we have divided into two components. First of all is the component of belonging to a recognized assessor company. So here we're looking for a, an organization that uh, is mature and professional in the way uh, that they handle such assessments. Uh, we have a variety of management system standards that are related uh, to this in the world of assessor companies, and I'll go through those on, on the next slide. Uh, but the key point is that the open group will accept organizations that are already certified management systems. And they're looking at things like documentation management, record control, personnel, training, resource management, their own internal auditing, and how they handle preventive and corrective actions. This reliance on, on existing industry standards is, is a very exciting uh, development uh, it allows uh, for 
uh, the recognised assessor programme to take advantage of the established pool of IA assessors and their companies that are already in professional practice. So we talked a little bit there about the company that could be a recognized assessor. We also talk about the individuals who are the actual assessors and their competency. So the requirements for that is that these people have already been trained as assessors and have a minimum of two years experience in performing process assessments and in looking at people's documentation, organizations' documentation. Thank you. Again, here I'm going to detail some of the standards or the standards that are currently accepted uh, in order to become a recognized assessor. So there on the left, there are three standards that are very often used uh, in the information assurance industry uh, to qualify assessment companies. There are ISO standards, and, and there are three of them listed there today. ISO IEC 17020, ISO IEC 17021, and ISO IEC 17025. So if a company is already accredited to these standards, then they can reuse that accreditation to become an open group assessor company. For the actual individual assessors, uh, then uh, the auditing or assessing qualifications that we commonly see in the information security assurance field can be accepted. The current list includes lead auditors for some of the ISO standards, the 27001, the information security management systems, the 9001, uh, the CMMI appraisers, uh, common criteria evaluators, and FIPS 140-2 testers. Uh, if you're interested uh, in applying, then all the information is on the accreditation program website. Okay, so uh, finally, um, here we uh, talk a little bit about uh, the specific requirements that are required uh, to join the Open Group program. So in addition to an existing management system, the company must also show and prove to the Open Group uh, Accreditation Authority that they do have established processes for performing OTTPS accreditations. And for the individual assessors, then uh, we work very hard to make sure that uh, the skill level of these people in, in the subject matter of OTTPS is sufficient. So we ask for skills in supply chain management, uh, the terminology and techniques. We ask for technical knowledge of all the OTTPS attributes and the OTTPS assessment program. And we also have in place an OTTPS assessor examination, uh, which the individuals must uh, successfully complete. So that's a brief overview of the accreditation program requirements to be recognized assessors. And with that, I'll hand over to Dan. I'm Dan Reddy from EMC Corporation, and I am co-chair of an internal work stream of the forum that is focused on a combined effort to both reach out to a number of global constituencies to inform them about our work, but also to harmonize our work in, in building the standard and the accreditation program with other initiatives where there may be some synergy. Our approach in this effort is to remain fact-based so that we can be a credible partner in this uh, broad community. When we're referenced by other entities, such as the ones mentioned here, like the GOA report, uh, GAO report, and um, the NIST special publication draft on supply chain risk, 
and uh, NASA RFP that has a reference to our our standard. We think if it is based on facts and the word gets out, that it helps everyone understand how our work ties in with with other work that that is uh, being done in in other spheres. Uh, on a regular basis, we are asked to speak at conferences where there may be a focus on maliciously tainted or counterfeit products, and there could be some synergy. And if you know of any such opportunities, you might bring that um, to our attention. In addition to focusing on facts for our outreach, we focus on the details of our technical content because we think that that's important for the community. Uh, we've done several internal efforts where we have taken our in our uh, detailed requirements and those in other standards, and we've looked for alignment or um, congruity or to identify possible differences and, and gaps. One strategy that we're following in order to build momentum whereby others can leverage our work is to um, – make it clear to the outside world what we're about and to talk about the value that we have in having someone voluntarily adopt our standard and uh, possibly the accreditation program. We think that it is a more solid foundation to take that approach rather than um, a process that would rely on mandatory regulation. As people uh, learn about our work, we, we hope that, there, that this effort will grow and there will be more cross-references and uh, that the demand will, will grow. So in terms of our priorities, um, obviously with the launch, there are activities like this podcast that, um, that are, are, are ongoing and um, – in, in support of the launch. And we think it's a big deal that we have a standard that focuses on supply chain risk management and offers a measurable method to gauge that conformance. So anything that we can do to uh, get the word out and um, is good. We hope to continuously look at our own content, especially as we compare it with content that may be out in, in the world at, at large. Let me just highlight some of our key priorities in this area of harmonization. And again, we've um, combined harmonization and, and outreach. Although this is a global standard built through consensus, we realize that there is further value in linking our work to that of ISO and IEC. We are actively exploring a potential stronger relationship with ISO uh, regarding their related work concerning supplier uh, relationships, and we have a formal liaison in place. And the open group is already a recognized submitter to ISO and IEC, so therefore we think we're in a good position to consider submitting our standard as a relevant part of the work uh, for ICT COTS providers. From the very outset of this initiative, we have made our relationship with the common criteria a high priority. Member of the many of the larger technology providers, uh, such as my company, are actively going through common criteria certifications for our products on a regular basis. We see a great deal of synergy. Um, some of the same companies and individuals who are working on the common criteria of supply chain technical working group are the same people and companies that are working on this initiative. We think that the threats that are being addressed here are also aligned um, between the groups. And we are moving in a direction of formalizing our working relationship with the Common Criteria Development Board, hopefully um, creating a formal liaison between the programs. As I had mentioned uh, previously, we feel that we can add value by mapping our work to those of others. And 
we have done that internally with much of the work uh, embedded in the, the common criteria, which looks at products, not at organizations uh, and the practices the way we do. But it's important to note that the members of this forum have adopted a measure once approach whereby during the trusted technology provider accreditation process that has been discussed today where um, for a particular product organization, they may encounter a situation where the assessor is looking for evidence that a product team has met a particular OTTPS requirement. That evidence may be the same, may, may be related to the same product that has been certified under common criteria for a matching requirement. We expect to be a leader in recognizing the value of those forms of evidence so that we can measure once as we go forward with our accreditation. So we, we believe that this approach of focusing on the facts and uh, the content and making continuous improvements is very important for uh, the ongoing credibility and, um, and adoption of, of our work. Um, so I think we're nearing the end. Uh, the next slide gives you um, an overview of a summary of the, the accreditation process that uh, Andras and, and Fiona have outlined. So this can be a good reference for you um, as you take a look through the slides. And then the, the last slide in the deck has a series of resources that we would encourage you to tap, talking about some of the work that we have, have done in written form or, or other testimonials and, um, and information that can be valuable. So on behalf of the entire team, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we, we would like to hear from you in terms of other ways that we can um, inform people about our work, and, and those opportunities will be something that we can capitalize in with your help. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you, panel. Um, we've now got to the stage where we can uh, go through some of the uh, questions that we've had submitted on the QA facility. Uh, we've got a few, so if anyone's got any more, then please do send them in now. Um, start with the best qu first question from John. Uh, John is asking, so if a specific product is accredited, does that mean the entire supply chain for that product has been reviewed and accredited? Or does each vendor stroke element in the supply chain need to be accredited? Who would like to pick that one up? Well, Alexandra, so, so uh, the organization as a whole becomes credited against the best practices. Uh, so you don't have to become accredited for each component or each element of the standard. It's a holistic approach. So the question I think really was, do, do we look at the entire supply chain in a product? And, and I think um, our best practices as our, our requirements, as Edna pointed out, do cover the full life cycle of a product. So from design disposal, including supplier relationships and, and, and how you interact with your suppliers and, and things like that, we do believe that it would be in the best interest of everyone if the component suppliers got accredited on their own. And we hope that, um, because that will be assurance that they're following the best practices through all of their development cycle and, and ensure that they're not contributing to tainted and counterfeit products. So the goal really is to have component suppliers also be accredited on their own. Did that answer the question between Andras and I? Yeah, and we also have a accreditation uh, requirements, best practices around kind of holding your suppliers to the same, uh, you know, level of integrity as that those uh, best practices defined in the uh, standard. Right, that's true. Okay, thanks. Go on to uh, actually, John's just um, put in another question, uh, asking: Has there been any thought 
to how a requirement for accreditation might be included in government contracts uh, competed under FAR Part 12, so FAR Part 12 commercial items. Hmm. Well, I, so if you look at NIST uh, SP 800161, um, they've done something very similar to what we have done here, and that, that is that they are trying to be descriptive uh, and outcome-based and not uh, pejorative. Uh, and they do cite the open technology, uh, the OTTPS standard in that in that uh, piece of work. Um, so I believe that if there is a uh, defined standard and there is a set of policies that make it established, you know, per the NDAA that was just uh, passed in twenty for for twenty fourteen. That uh, we may be one of uh, uh, probably maybe the the preeminent program in which to measure um, you know compliance, uh, but uh, there might be uh, many different ways a company can can use both this program and other techniques to show compliance. So we're hoping that this doesn't like get written into some sort of stone, you know, from a policy perspective because. Uh, that there may be many exceptions uh, as well as rules that, that could be established and that might make it more difficult for the industry to evolve over the period of, uh, of the next few years. You know, if I could just emphasize that, you know, I mentioned that our approach is to get people to pay attention to this on a voluntary basis and not to try and uh, actively try and get it in, embedded <clears throat> in regulation. And as Andras said, there are, especially in the area of supply chain, this is evolving, and it is unclear to many in the U.S. exactly what constitutes the right kind of best practices and how you measure it. And as he said, we do offer something that is clear, built mm -hmm. through global consensus, and is measurable. And when you compare some of the baseline controls in 853, for example, I think there is good alignment between many of the fundamental practices that we have in our standard and the accreditation program that line up suitably with, um, with some of those expectations. Okay, so let's go on to uh, the next question. This is a question from Richard, where it's a question and a statement. So first he's saying congratulations to IBM for being the first certified uh, he's asking, how quickly can we expect other vendors achieving certification? Uh, do we have any visibility on that stage yet? So this is Edna from um, from Cisco. Let me let me take a crack at that. I, I I think Richard that we have membership that is looking at it. So those vendors who are part of the TTF, um, as well as those outside. And I don't think we can give you a specific anticipated commitment on when folks might be accredited. I think everybody's in the stage of evaluating um, the excellent work that has been done by the forum and the standards alignment with other standards which are um, utilized across our various organizations. So that's a, that's a way of answering without specifically answering. Lots of folks thinking about it, um, not sure yet. We do have one other company that's participating in the pilot um, at the moment. So I, I think we're all weighing the, the many benefits that we see and trying to fit it into our schedules over the next fiscal year or so. Thanks, Edna. Uh, so question here from uh, Jerry. Uh, so this is a long one, so bear with me. Um, Jerry's asking, how does accreditation requirements impact small businesses that are engineering services and ID product integrators for the larger OEMs? He goes on, will small businesses be expected to be accredited if they are in an authorized reseller or IT product, of IT products, sorry? Yeah, I, I, I believe our goal as industry leaders, and uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, our our government partners would also agree, is that over a period of time, you would see the industry adopt the best practices, and that would include, you know, small companies as well as large companies. And we really painstakingly took a lot of effort. Uh, 
uh, to focus on making these best practices consumable for small, you know, one, two, three, four, five, fifty-person companies. Um, so I, I, I believe that you know it's very much you know attainable for a smaller companies, you know, even a one-man company. Um, it it, it uh, is certainly probably even um, a little bit more work for larger organizations, I think, in some ways, because you have, you have separate kind of lines of responsibility. Um, but these are best practices, and, and you know, very similar to you know ISO 20, 000, uh, 27,000 uh, security controls, you know, based on you know outcome-based best practices uh, for supply chain security and integrity. If I could just add to to that answer, we were also very cognizant as we were building the uh, accreditation program that there was enough flexibility that we could accommodate a number of different situations where we would have different kinds of organizations. It could be an integrator, it could be a component supplier, and the way they described what their products are had that same flexibility because we felt that it was not possible to build something that was one size fits all. And yet we had to have enough um, standardization to have real conformance that you could uh, bank on. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a good question, uh, Dan. I mean, a point, Dan, because we use the word provider, you know, consciously. Uh, we didn't use the word supplier, right? We use provider because a provider might be an integrator or they might be a, uh, a, a an actual producer of a product. That gets consumed upstream, right? And they could be producing that at any level within the supply chain, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is Sally uh, from the Open Group. I, I think I think the one of the beautiful things about this program is its holistic approach, as one of Andras's slides pointed out. So that if we can really get all constituents involved, which really is the point of securing the whole, all of the global supply chains, then that would be, that would be a wonderful thing. Your component suppliers are practicing the best practices and are accredited. The technology providers who are utilizing the component suppliers and integrating their components get accredited. The integrators get accredited. And then, and then you, then you ask, then you partner with those Trusted, open trusted technology providers who are accredited, reducing the risk of counterfeit and uh, tainted products. So, so yeah, this is a global standard, and it affects, it does affect um, all constituents. And, and the point, one of our mantras was to raise all boats, so to make it attainable for all constituents around the world. Thanks, Sally. We've got one final question. Uh, this is from Shrikar, and I think he's really asking for uh, a little bit of information about the uh, upside of getting involved. Uh, so he's asking, what is, it, what is in it for organizations that have to fund the implementation for accreditation? And he's given an example. So accreditation to uh, OTTPS will bring an organization to any compliance requirements, such as PCI, DSS, or FISMA or HIPAA, and he says, if not, organizations not, may not really fund it. So does someone want to just talk to that, uh, that point? So, so yeah. you know, first off, I would say, you know, uh, my, my position from his company's point of view would be reviewing and, and assessing uh, the standard itself, the impact on your business, with respect to the standard, and are you actually conducting those best practices? Uh, and then you have to make a business decision about um, the customers you're serving, or the supplier, or, or the provider who's using your components, and and uh, the uh, the business decision they're making to prioritize over those component suppliers uh, who are providing uh, not only a well-formed you know, valuable service or product, but also one that they can trust. And so really this is going to be, you know, business driven requirement ultimately. But I would I would, you know, begin assessing uh and using the standard today. 
this is Edna. Let me join in as well, and, and Dan may want to speak to this. There's a corollary to that as well, which is in addition to assessing yourself, as Andras just articulated, we have gone out of our way and will continue to do so to identify where we align um, with other standards, some of which you referenced. And the reality is that there may be some overlap, there may be some positive recognition where you can, when I say overlap, not in a negative way, but a benefit from doing one that you will automatically get credit for or be able to leverage and utilize effectively. So, you know, this isn't a, a standalone uh, a standard that sits on a mountain and does not recognize that is part of a global standards environment. And I think that's very important to note that most of us who will be looking at this will recognize that it fits nicely and dovetails with some of the other activities in which you're engaged. But again, you are correct. All of us need to make business decisions based on cost and efficiencies. And that is the very fact why we tried to align and we had a harmonization organization or subtract that Dan was heavily involved with. Dan, do you want to, do you want to elaborate well, I, on that? Sure. I, I do agree with Edna and Andras in terms of, uh, the business decision around the value. Do you and your customers see value in being listed as a trusted technology provider in a way that has been measured by an independent third party? That's the fundamental decision. And when you look uh, across the landscape of, of requirements, the whole area of supply chain is relatively new to some of the other areas of security. And this is something that is concrete, has value, and is being measured today. How you translate this particular conformance through the accreditation program to the various groups that you work with, I think it, it represents solid evidence that you can point to. We are focused on the, the threats of maliciously tainted and counterfeit. But some of our practices that are foundational include regular things like vulnerability response and secure coding. And, and <clears throat> these are things that you can point to in a variety of settings where you've had a third party assess your practices. Okay, team, thank you for that. Well, we've come to um, uh, the end of the question. So I think this would probably be a good time to um, bring today's event to a an end, but Sally, would you like uh, like to say anything um, just to finish off with? Sure. Just thank you for everyone who participated, and please do feel free to contact me, s.long at opengroup.org if you have any further questions. And also, the links on the slides um, are, are very important. Um, please go visit the forum to see what that's all about. But the accreditation link will take you right to the live launched accreditation program and has all the information there that you would need to prepare for accreditation, including the standards and um, the policy and the assessment procedures. So please do explore that site. Thank you, Sally, everybody. One, la what, one last ahead, thing, Dan. I would just like to clarify that you do not have to be an open group member to take advantage of the free standard or to go through the accreditation program. We certainly welcome people to join as members if they want to shape the future of the standard in the accreditation program, but it is not a requirement for being accredited. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. All right, Sally. Well, thank you for that. Thank you, team, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and I'll uh, bring today's event to a halt now. Thank you very much.